Welcome to nonstopneuron.com, where learning medical concepts is as easy as watching cartoons. In the next 25 minutes, you will learn everything about the normal electrocardiogram, starting from the very basics of recording any electrical activity to how 12 lead ECG is obtained and how different waves on ECG are produced. The topic is presented in a step-by-step -step and easy-to-digest manner, so by the end, you will have no confusion regarding ECG. Let's start with the basics of recording electrical activity. An electrical meter, used to record any electric activity, has two electrodes, a positive and a negative. The meter shows the potential at the positive electrode as compared to that on the other side. So I will keep the positive electrode marked with a green circle, so you always know from where we are comparing. First, imagine a charged battery that has a positive potential on one end and a negative potential on the other end. Here we have connected the positive electrode to the positive side of the battery. So this electrode is at a positive potential with respect to the other one. So the meter shows a positive reading. If we flip the battery, now this electrode is at a negative potential. So the meter shows a negative reading. In short, the meter shows the potential on its positive electrode as compared to that at the negative electrode. The more powerful the battery, the higher will be the reading. And if the battery is dead, means if the potential difference across the battery is lost, the meter will not show any reading. That makes sense, right? Now let's replace the battery with a series of cells. We know that during the resting condition, the inside of the cell is electronegative and the outside is electropositive. We connect the electrodes at the ends of the series. See, we put the electrodes outside the cells, so they detect the potential on the outer side only. As far as recording is concerned, we can ignore the potential inside the cell. For now, I am showing it in a light color for your reference, but I will talk only about the outside potential. Now in the beginning, both electrodes are at positive potential. Or in other words, there is no potential difference between the two. So the meter shows no reading. Now let's say the cells are stimulated from this end. This will depolarize cells near this end. During depolarization, the positive ions rush into the cells. This makes the outside of the cell electronegative. The action potential has not yet reached this end. So the cells on this end are still in a polarized resting state with electropositivity outside. So at this point in time, the potential at this electrode is positive with respect to the other electrode. So for a brief period, the meter shows a positive reading. On graph paper, it's recorded as an upward wave. Now, the action potential travels in this direction. So these cells also depolarize by inrushing of positive ions into the cell, making the outside electronegative. At this point, both electrodes have the same negative potential. Or in other words, there is no potential difference. So the meter shows no reading, and the graph returns to the zero level. Then the cells start to repolarize. As these cells depolarized first, they are also to repolarize first. In repolarization, the positive ions come out of the cell and make the outside electropositive again. At this point, the other end is still depolarized with negativity outside. Thus, this electrode is at electronegativity as compared to this one. So now the meter shows a negative reading. On the graph, it appears as a negative wave. Then, as the remaining cells also get repolarized, the potential around those cells also becomes positive. Now again, there is no difference in potential between two electrodes. So there is no reading, and the graph comes back to zero line. So this is how the spread of depolarization or repolarization produces waves. So far, so good. Till now, we were playing in a straight line in one dimension. In this, there are only two possibilities for impulse to spread, from right to left and from left to right. Now let's expand in two dimensions. For this, imagine cells spread on a plane. 
In this, there are many directions in which the impulse might spread. Let's take an example where we have placed electrodes on the horizontal axis, and the current is flowing at a certain angle with respect to the orientation of the electrodes. In this case, the meter cannot fully detect the current. To understand the recording, we need to think of this current as made up of two components. One that runs parallel to the direction of electrode placement, and the other component is perpendicular to that. The electrodes record only that component of the current that is parallel. The perpendicular component is not recorded by the meter. In fact, if the current happens to be perfectly perpendicular, there won't be any recording at all. This is because in such cases, both electrodes would be at the same potential all the time. Let me explain. In the beginning, when all cells are in a resting state, the potential around all the cells would be positive. So there is no recording. As the depolarization travels perpendicular to the electrodes, both the sides of tissue, where electrodes are placed, get electronegative at the same time. So again, there is no difference in potential between the electrodes, and therefore no recording. Similarly, repolarization also happens at the same time at both electrodes, so this also produces no change. In short, if the impulse travels perpendicular to the electrodes, there won't be any recording. What you need to remember from this discussion is that the meter records only projections of currents that fall in the direction of the electrode placement. The perpendicular components are missed. To solve this problem, we can use one more electrical meter. If we place its electrodes perpendicular to the previous one, now we can record the perpendicular component as well. Thus, by using two electrical meters, we can measure all the currents in the plane. For any current, the horizontal electrodes measure the projection on the horizontal axis, and the electrodes placed vertically record the projection on the vertical axis. By combining the two, we can interpret the overall direction. As such, two meters are enough to map all the currents in a plane, but we can use more meters for better recording. For example, the current in this direction is best recorded by the electrodes placed like this. And if current flows in this direction, that will be best recorded by electrodes placed like this. In short, for the recording of electrical activities in a two-dimensional plane, we need at least two electrical meters, and preferably, even more. Now it's time to move from two dimensions to three dimensions. Are you ready? Okay, let's go to the heart right away. The heart shows electrical activities all around in three dimensions. So for better mapping of its electrical activity, we need to record it from multiple angles. Generally, we record 12 angles. On the frontal or coronal plane, we record six directions. And on the transverse or horizontal plane, we record six more. Collectively, all these angles provide a comprehensive view of all the cardiac activity. Now, in the language of electrocardiogram, the electrical meters used to record each angle is called a lead. So each lead has two electrodes, one positive and one negative. And total, we have 12 leads to record from 12 angles. Of course, we cannot probe everyone's chest to put electrodes directly on the heart. Rather, we connect them to various points on the skin. As our body is a good conductor of electricity, we can record potentials from the skin also. So now let's talk about how all these angles are recorded by different leads from the skin. On the frontal plane, first, we have three standard bipolar limb leads. Lead 1 records exactly the horizontal angle with a positive electrode towards the left of the person. This direction is considered a reference zero-degree angle. Lead 2 records plus 60 degrees to this. And lead 3 is oriented plus 120 degrees. We can draw the same directions in the form of a triangle around the heart. This is called Eindhoven's triangle. To record the electrical activities from these directions, we need to put electrodes at the tips of the triangle. Actually, each of the upper corners of Eindhoven's triangle is on each shoulder, and the lower corner is towards the groin. But that's not 
where the electrodes are actually placed. In fact, the upper electrodes are placed on the wrist of both arms, and the lower electrode is placed on the ankle of the left leg. As the body is an electrical conductor, placing the electrode on the arm is equivalent to placing it on the respective shoulder, and placing it on any of the legs is equivalent to placing it on the groin. By convention, the bottom electrode is placed on the left leg. So these are the final connection points. Lead one has the positive electrode on the left arm and the negative electrode on the right arm. Lead two has the positive electrode on the left leg and a negative electrode on the right arm. And lead three has the positive electrode on the left leg and a negative electrode on the left arm. Thus, technically, we make six connections, two connections at each limb. But that's not it. There's also a practical aspect concerned with this. See, at any given point on the skin, all the electrodes are going to be at the same electrical potential. Like, both these electrodes are going to detect the same potential as they are connected to the same spot. Similarly, these electrodes also record the same potential at the left arm. And same applies here also. So for convenience, we merge all the wires at each point into one electrode. So practically, we need only three electrodes to create these three leads. So these were the standard bipolar limb leads. Next, we have augmented unipolar limb leads. They measure the currents from minus 150 degree, minus 30 degree, and plus 90 degree angles on the frontal plane. They use the same electrodes on the limbs that we placed earlier. To create a lead at minus 150 degree, we connect the positive end of the measuring device to the right arm, and negative electrode is connected to both the left arm and left leg. Electrically, connecting an electrode to two points is equivalent to putting it midway between them. This midpoint falls near the middle of the heart. So the line from this point to the right arm is at minus 150 degree. This lead is called AVR. Here A stands for augmented, V represents unipolar, and R indicates that the positive electrode is placed on the right arm. Similarly, a lead at minus 30 degree is obtained by placing the positive electrode on the left arm, and negative electrode is connected to the right arm and leg. Here also, the midpoint of both negative connections represents the electrical reference point in the heart. This is called AVL, where L is for the left arm. And a 90-degree lead is created by connecting the positive electrode to the left foot, and negative electrode to both arms, which again represents the same reference midpoint. This is called AVF, where F is for the foot. Thus, we have three augmented unipolar limb leads. These leads are called unipolar because, in each of them, only one electrode is out of the heart. The other is a common reference point inside the heart. That's why they are called unipolar limb leads. On the other hand, in standard bipolar limb leads, both electrodes are outside the heart on different sides. So they are called bipolar leads. Collectively, the standard bipolar limb leads and augmented unipolar limb leads define axes every 30 degrees interval in the frontal plane. All these connections can be shown in a simplified way like this. We have three standard bipolar limb leads along each edge of the triangle. And three augmented unipolar limb leads connect an electric reference point at the middle of the heart to each corner of the triangle. So these are the leads on the frontal plane. Now let's study the leads on the transverse plane. Here we have six precordial leads in these directions. If we see them in a cut section from the top, they go like this. They are named V1 to V6. They all have a common negative connection at the center of the heart, similar to augmented unipolar limb leads. This point is obtained by combining all three electrodes on the limbs that we saw earlier. Connecting to all these points 
is equivalent to putting the electrode to the same electrical reference point in the middle of the heart. The positive electrodes are placed on the chest around the heart. V1 is put on the fourth intercostal space to the right of the sternum. V2 on the fourth intercostal space to the left of the sternum. V4 on the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line. V3 halfway between V2 and V4. V6 on the fifth intercostal space at the mid axillary line. And V5 halfway between V4 and V6. Thus, from the common negative electrode inside the heart to a positive electrode on the surface, we have six directions. So these were all the leads on the transverse plane. Bringing all the leads together, on the frontal plane, we have three standard bipolar limb leads, named lead 1, 2, and 3, and three augmented limb leads named AVR, AVL, and AVF. On the transverse plane, we have six precordial leads named V1 to V6. Thus total, we have 12 leads. Each of these lead looks at the heart from a unique angle. It's like taking photographs of a person from different angles. Just like how different angles show different sides of the body, electrical activities of some areas of the heart are better recorded in some leads than others. Lead 2, 3, and AVF are oriented downwards. So they provide a better picture of electrical activity in the inferior wall of the heart. This region receives blood from the right coronary artery. Lead 1, AVL, V5, and V6 are oriented laterally, so they provide a better picture of the lateral wall of the heart. This region of the heart is supplied by the left circumflex artery. V1 and V2 are nearest to the interventricular septum. And V3 and V4 are nearer to the anterior wall of the heart. So they provide a better picture of these areas. These areas are supplied by the left anterior descending artery. A disease affecting a particular region produces more prominent changes in their respective leads. For example, acute myocardial infarction involving the inferior portion of the heart is easily visualized in leads 2, 3, and AVF, but may go completely undetected in the other leads. So this was about obtaining 12-lead ECG. Now let's see how normal ECG waves are produced during a cardiac cycle. We will study the recordings on lead 2. As we saw earlier, this lead records the electrical activity from a 60-degree angle on the frontal plane. Its positive electrode is on the bottom side, so the direction of waves depends on which potential is facing this side. Now in the beginning, all the muscle cells are in a polarized state, so they all have positive charges around them. To keep the visuals clean, I will show a minimum of these charges. As both the electrodes are at the same potential, the lead detects nothing at the beginning, and we get a flat line at zero level. Now impulse is generated at the SA node, and it first depolarizes the atrial musculature. The direction of this current is this, so initially the cells on the upper right side get depolarized. If we project this potential difference on the axis of lead, we can see that the positive electrode detects the positive potential as compared to the other side. So the meter shows positive reading, and we get a positive wave. Then, remaining atrial muscle cells also get depolarized. So both the electrodes come to the same potential again. So nothing is detected, and the graph comes back to baseline. This wave, due to atrial depolarization, is called the P wave. As atrial musculature is thin, the wave is small in magnitude. And second, there are no Purkin J fibers in the atria. So the impulse travels at a slower speed. Because of that, this wave is seen for a longer duration, or we can say it's wider on the graph. After that, we see a flat line during which the atria are contracting, and the impulse is slowly traveling in the AV node. As no change is occurring in the polarity of the fibers, no change is detected during this period. Then the impulse comes out of the AV node, 
and starts depolarizing ventricles. First, it depolarizes a tiny portion of the septum form left to right in this direction. First, the cells on the left side get depolarized. Projection of this current on lead 2 shows that the positive electrode is near negative potential. So we get a negative wave. This is called a Q wave. Because it's produced by a very small mass of tissue, it's very weak. Many times it's not even seen at all. Then the impulse spreads through the septum and apical region to most of the ventricular musculature. In the wall, the direction of depolarization is from the endocardium to the outer surface. So the endocardium depolarizes first, and then the outer surface. The overall direction of this spread is this. It's the upper cells that depolarize first. The projection of this current shows positive potential towards a positive electrode. So we get a positive wave. It's called R wave. As a large mass of musculature is depolarized during this, the wave is very tall. At the base, the right side depolarizes earlier. So at the end, we have a small portion remaining on the left side. Here, depolarization spreads in this direction. The bottom cells depolarize first. Now observe this. The positive electrode is closer to the negative potential, as compared to the opposite side, which is still positive. So, this direction of spread produces a negative wave. This is called the S wave. Again, as it happens only in a small mass of tissue, this wave is small. As the remaining mass also gets depolarized, the depolarization of the entire ventricles gets complete. At present, there is no potential difference across the lead. So lead detects nothing, and the graph returns to zero. Thus, we get the QRS complex from the depolarization of the ventricle. As Purkinje fibers and ventricles carry impulses very fast, all of this happens very quickly. So the duration of the QRS complex is relatively shorter than what we might expect, based on the duration of the P wave of atrial depolarization. So this was ventricular depolarization. This is followed by a period of ventricular contraction. During this, there is no electrical activity. Now let's see the activities related to repolarization. First, the atria repolarize. Generally, the cells that depolarize first also repolarize first. So repolarization spreads in the same direction as depolarization. So here, the upper cells repolarize first. Because of this, for a brief period, the negative potential is facing the positive electrode. Then the remaining atrial musculature also repolarizes, and the potential becomes equal. Thus, atrial repolarization tends to produce a negative wave. It's called the atrial T wave. However, this event happens at the same time when the ventricles are being depolarized, and the QRS complex is being produced. As those activities are much stronger, the atrial T wave is obscured by the QRS complex. Then, after a pause for ventricular contraction, ventricular repolarization begins. Here we have an unusual thing. As depolarization spread from the endocardium to the surface, the order of repolarization should also be the same, right? But it is not. First, the outer surface repolarizes. The reason is that in the contracted state of the ventricle, the endocardium is at higher pressure. So capillaries over there get occluded. The decreased blood flow delays repolarization in the endocardium. So repolarization begins on the outer surface and spreads to the endocardium. The overall direction of this repolarization is opposite to that of depolarization. The cells on the lower side repolarize first. As positive potential is facing the positive electrode, the recording of this activity produces a positive wave. Then, as the remaining cells also repolarize, we again have the same potential all over, and nothing is detected. Thus, ventricular repolarization produces a T wave. Regarding the duration of the T wave, in any region, some ventricular fibers start repolarizing earlier and some after a delay. 
so repolarization occurs over a longer period, and the T wave gets spread over a longer duration. As it expands over a longer duration, its height also becomes small. This completes the entire cardiac cycle, and we are back to the starting position. All the cells are again at a resting polarized state, with the positive potential outside. This is followed by the next impulse, and the same activities are repeated. So this is how a normal electrocardiogram is produced. Now let's talk about the intervals and segments studied in the ECG. First, we have a PQ interval, or PR interval. It's a period between the onset of the P wave to the onset of the Q wave. Often the Q wave is not seen, so this is also called the PR interval. It signifies atrial depolarization and conduction of impulse through the AV node. Normally, it's about 0.16 seconds in duration. Next, we have the QT interval. It's the period between the onset of the Q wave to end of the T wave. It indicates a period of ventricular contraction, starting from depolarization to the end of repolarization. Normally, it's about 0.35 seconds. Then we have the ST segment. Its duration is between the end of the S wave and the onset of the T wave. It coincides with the plateau in action potential inside muscle fibers. And finally, we have the RR interval. It's the period between two consecutive R waves. It indicates the duration of one cardiac cycle. At a normal heart rate of about 72 beats per minute, it's about 0.83 seconds. So this was all about normal electrocardiograms. Now let's have a summary. An electrical meter, or a lead, records the potential at its positive end as compared to the negative end. If it's at a positive potential, it shows a positive reading. And if it's at a negative potential, it shows a negative reading. If the potential on both ends is the same, it shows no reading. It can record only that portion of the electrical activity that falls parallel to the direction of the electrode placement. The perpendicular activities are not recorded. In the heart, the activities happen in many directions in three dimensions. So for better mapping of these activities, we use multiple leads. Three standard bipolar limb leads are created on the coronal plane by connecting electrodes at both arms and the left leg. These three connections represent the tips of Eindhoven's triangle around the heart. Three augmented unipolar limb leads are created using the same electrodes. Each augmented lead uses one of these electrodes as the positive end and a combination of the remaining two as a negative end. For six chest leads or precordial leads on the transverse plane, a positive electrode is placed on the chest at different points around the heart. And they all use a common negative connection obtained by combining all three electrodes on the limbs. This is equivalent to putting their negative electrodes in the middle of the heart. Each of these 12 leads records the heart's activity from a unique angle. So some areas are better recorded in some leads than others. In normal ECG, the P wave is produced by atrial depolarization. The QRS complex is produced by ventricular depolarization. Atrial repolarization occurs along with the QRS complex, so it's obscured. Ventricular repolarization produces the T wave. Different intervals studied in ECG are the PQ interval or PR interval, QT interval, ST segment, and RR interval. One last thing, please don't comment that I missed the electrode on right leg. It's used for grounding only, so I purposefully didn't mention it to prevent confusion. Now the fact that you watched the video till the end means you learned a lot from this video. So to support the creation of more such videos, I request you to share it with all your friends. It not only helps your friend, but it also tells the YouTube algorithm to recommend this video to more viewers. So please take a moment to share, like, and comment. Thanks for kind support. See you in the next video.